Um, so you are founder of Bay.com, B-A-Y, B-A-Y-E dot com, um, which is your high intensity strength training website. And you're a personal trainer and have been for some time. Um, is that a good enough introduction or is there more that? That works. Yeah. It's okay. And um, I just wanted to go on. Sorry. So that, that pretty much covers it. <laughs> good, good. Uh, Drew, you might want to just come in a little closer just because the, the, you can be quite faint. That's great. Thank you. Um, okay, so I just wanted to start off with um, your uh, summary of what high intensity training is. The reason I ask that is because um, you know my other listeners might not have heard my other um, interviews. So I always like to start off with the definition that you have for high intensity training and and and, and educate people on on the the, you know, the essentials of what it actually is. Well, uh, first, it's important to uh, explain what intensity is because a lot of times people use intensity to refer to the load, like uh, 80% of their one repetition maximum. Uh, a lot of times it would be referred to as 80% intensity. But uh, we use the term intensity differently. Rather than meaning a specific percentage of load, uh, specifically what we're using it for is to describe the effort a person is putting into the exercise. And what intensity of effort is, is how hard you are working at any moment compared to how hard you are capable of working. So, uh, again, using the example of load, if you start an exercise with 80% of what you could lift one time, your effort at that point in the exercise is 80%. As you continue through the exercise and as your muscles fatigue, what was initially 80% becomes an increasing percentage of your decreasing strength. So the effort that you have to put into moving that weight increases. Eventually, you get to a point where your strength is decreased to where it matches the resistance provided by the weight, at which point you're working at maximum intensity. What high-intensity training is, is working at a basically a high level of intensity of effort. And uh, this is what is typically uh, recommended is to continue every exercise to the point of momentary muscular failure, the point where it is impossible to continue the exercise in the prescribed form. And because high intensity training is very intense, it has to be very brief and it has to be relatively infrequent. You can do something hard or you can do something long, but you can't have both. Uh, for example, if you were to walk, you could walk for hours. But if you sprint as hard and fast as you can, you won't be able to maintain that pace very long. Same with uh, resistance training. The higher the intensity of effort that you put into uh, an exercise, the fewer sets and the fewer exercises you can do. Also, the greater the intensity of effort, the greater the stress on the body that it has to recover from before producing the adaptations stimulated by the workout. And uh, th th those two words are important, stimulate and produce. Exercise does not directly produce any improvements in the body. In fact, your body views exercise as a negative, it's a stress. It's uh, threatening your ability to move. Exercise doesn't produce, it stimulates the body to produce the improvements in the forms of increased muscular strength and size, improved cardiovascular and metabolic efficiency, uh, connective tissue and bone strength, etc. Um, one way to look at it is when you are exercising, you're trying to send a message to your body that its current capability is inadequate to meet some demand that your environment is placing on it. And that should it survive, it needs to become stronger, better conditioned, so that the next time it encounters that same stress, that same demand, it's better able to cope with it. Movement is absolutely essential to life. If you can't move, you can't obtain food. You can't prevent yourself from becoming food for something else. Uh, can't uh, procreate, can't do anything necessary to sustain life if you can't move. So our body prioritizes Anything that is very threatening to our ability to produce movement is going to be a strong stimulus for improving that ability. But uh, again, exercise stimulates, the body produces the improvement. 
And for your body to produce those improvements, you have to leave it alone for a while, allow it to recover from, uh, and then produce the adaptations from the exercise. Uh, another way to look at it is like, uh, and I like this analogy of getting a suntan. And this analogy actually extends uh, far beyond this, but uh, when you are laying out in the sun, the sun is not directly causing your skin to tan. The uh, ultraviolet radiation is a threat, and your skin responds to that threat by producing more melanin. Now, if you were to lay out too long, you would end up going past the point where you're stimulating an adaptive response to the point where you're causing damage. This doesn't mean that you can only lay out for so many minutes, go inside, and then come right back out a minute later and do it again, though. You have to allow your body some time after that exposure to recover and, and at least recover, uh, and then ideally start producing some other response. Um, same with exercise. When you are exercising, you want to do enough to stimulate the body to produce that response and then leave your body alone and let it do its thing. Now, this can mean very different frequencies of training for different people, though. Uh, some people can work out three times a week and recover from that and adapt uh, and uh, progress pretty well. Uh, some people require as just, much just, as two weeks. Just to interject. Time. Sorry, Drew. I've just, that's really fascinates me. Um, you know, uh, I remember in Body by Science, Doug says about um, it takes – the the average recovery time is four to seven days for most people. Um, I don't know if you, you agree with that. Does that? It varies a lot between individuals. Really? And, it, and a lot of it depends on how hard people are training. Yeah. Most of the research shows little difference between two and three times a week for beginners. More than that, it uh, doesn't produce better results and often produces worse results if the intensity of effort is high. Uh, there is also very little difference between training once a week and twice a week, but that's looking at averages. If you look at individuals, you'll find that it varies considerably. There are some people who can train more frequently. There are some people who, if they train more often than you know, once every few weeks, they get weaker rather than stronger. It's like any other human trait. You know, we've got giants and we have midgets. Uh, we have people with extremely dark skin, people with extremely light skin. A lot of us are in the middle, but you're going to find people towards the extremes. I start people out training three times a week for the first couple of weeks that they're training because the additional frequency is beneficial for learning the exercises. They're not starting out hard, though. It's a moderate intensity. Learning to do it right is more important than doing it hard at first. But once people get to a point where they start training intensely, they need more recovery time in between. And uh, the majority of the people that I've trained have done best at about twice a week. Uh, I have had people who've had to cut back further than that. I've had a few extreme cases that had to cut back to once every 10 to 14 days. But uh, I've found most people, and again, this is my experience, uh, and that's also going to be affected by, by the uh, people that I'm working with, most people seem to be fine starting at twice a week, but you can't have a specific prescription for everybody. The general principles apply across the board. The general principles of exercise are the same for you, me, any human being on the planet that is healthy enough and physically capable of exercise. But how those principles are applied has to take into account individual variability and response to exercise, goals, um, other life circumstances that affect how frequently and how long it's practical for you to train. Uh, so as, as far as frequency goes, though, um, I would disagree that most people require that much time in between. Uh, it, it has not been my experience. Now, it doesn't hurt to get extra rest. In fact, if you get more rest, you might have a slightly slower rate of uh, progress, but again, there wasn't a huge difference uh, between once and twice a week in, in a lot of research that medics did at the University of Florida back in the 90s. Um, but if you do more training, more often than what your body can effectively recover from and adapt to, you can actually plateau or uh, even get uh, weaker. You should always be getting stronger at uh, each session. You should be getting stronger, but it's very important to distinguish between strength increases and performance improvements. 
because it is possible for a person to get stronger but not perform as many repetitions on an exercise if they are also improving their form considerably. This is more of an issue to beginning, starting out, but uh, what is happening in the gym is affected by so many different things. Your motivation level, um, what you had to eat earlier in the day, your rest. Uh, there are a lot of things that, call, that affect progress or performance during the, the workout. So you can't really look at it on a workout-to-workout -workout basis. Rather, you have to track workouts over time and look at trends. You should be getting stronger over a period of weeks, months, but it's unrealistic to expect a constant increase on a workout-to-workout -workout basis, even with adequate recovery. Um, at best, you know, most people are going to make most of the progress uh, towards their maximum potential for strength and size in about the first six months to a year of training. A lot of the rest of that in the second or third year. And after that, it gradually levels off. So anybody that's a little bit more advanced is going to find that even if they're letting their body recover adequately, they're not going to see. They're going to be going up 5, 10 pounds of time on exercise. Um, what's more important is that you are consistently maintaining good form and yeah, keeping track of how you're performing on a workout-to-workout -workout basis and using that as a guide rather than you know every single workout comparing what you've done to the workout before. Okay, fascinating. Um, I'd be interested in, because um, I think one of the, and I'm sure you'll be familiar with this, is there's a lot of um, resistance to high intensity training. Um, I don't know what the situation is in the States, but in the UK, it's very, it's really a challenge. You almost have to become, become a master, and I'm sure you know this very well, of being able to articulate high intensity training and its benefits very, very concisely. Um, in order to explain to people and persuade people that it's, uh, you know, arguably much more effective exercise protocol than most most things out there. Yeah. Uh, is that is that is? It, do you still come up against a lot of criticism, and how do you overcome that? Yeah, because people don't know what the hell they're talking about, <laughs> and unfortunately, much of what people are exposed to when they begin working out is, you know, stuff from the, the mainstream fitness media, which doesn't exist to provide accurate fitness information. It exists to promote supplements and, and uh, other products that their advertisers pay them to sell. And then you have certain athletic training organizations that have agendas uh, and it has more to do with politics and ego than science. If you look at the research, there is no significant advantage to doing more work more frequently than what most high-intensity training programs involve. And across the board, whether you compare weight, rep range, all that stuff, none of those things make nearly as much difference as the intensity of effort a person trains with. Uh, it's, it's the most important thing in exercise is that intensity of effort. And, and Quite frankly, if you are training with a sufficiently high intensity of effort, you will not be able to do more than a very brief workout infrequently. Um, most, most people, unfortunately, are more interested in things that are fun to them or things that allow them to uh, socialize than what is supported by science. It's... It is an industry that has been dominated and uh, unfortunately you know, messed up by commercial interests. If people paid attention to science instead of all the magazines and the hype and all that stuff, uh, most people would train harder, they'd train less frequently, uh, they would get better results with much, much fewer injuries. But uh, it's, it's driven by fads and trends and uh, commercial interests, not science. Unfortunately, uh, the majority of people uh, don't have the critical thinking skills to differentiate between the two, don't understand enough about science to be able to distinguish between what is science and what is fun. And uh, quite frankly, yeah, most people, I, I hate to say it, but the, most people are barely a step above chimpanzees intellectually and simply don't have... Uh, the intellectual capacity to get it. Uh, that's uh, a big part of the reason that it's uh, only popular among a small thinking minority. 
Yeah. That's, that's a good point. Um, do you, has anyone ever told you you're quite popular for using the word bullshit? Well, you can't talk about <laughs> this industry without using the word bullshit. <laughs> Bullshit is probably the fitness industry's, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the best description of it. Almost every single thing. If you go to any bookstore and you go and you pick out a hundred books on exercise at random, at least 99% of those are going to be bullshit. And the one remaining one that's not completely bullshit is still going to have a good percentage of it there. If you pick up any of the muscle uh, and fitness uh, or flex or iron or iron man is okay, but if you pick up a lot of these bodybuilding magazines, most of what's in there is bullshit. If you go and watch personal trainers in gyms, most of what they're teaching is bullshit. You can't, you cannot. Well, you could use uh, it's not a less as a term, nonsense, but uh, you cannot accurately and honestly describe the fitness industry. Without calling it bullshit or nonsense or bunk, bunk, because that's unfortunately that's the majority of what it is. Uh, I absolutely agree. Um, I'd just be really interested because um, I I feel like I'm quite good at sourcing information on health and fitness. But how do you, when you're looking at a study, let's say, how do you um, discern its quality? Well, it's. it's here, and here's the important thing. You have to look at the whole study. You can't just look at abstract. Because often what the abstract reports is the researcher's conclusions based on the data, which are going to be affected by their biases, their expectations. Uh, so you have to read full studies. And you have to look at the methodology. And a lot of studies are crappy because they don't adequately control for a lot of variables which have a considerable effect on, on the outcomes. Uh, for example, very, very few resistance training studies take into account the repetition duration. And there's a huge difference between doing an exercise at a one-second lifting and one-second lowering cadence and uh, taking three to four seconds to lift and lower the weight. Um, if you are not keeping track of these things during study, you know, if you've got different people that are performing exercises at different cadences, you know, that can cause the results to go you know, all over the place. And it's a, it's a, you have to control for all these variables. The thing is, a lot of researchers don't seem to appreciate all the variables that they have to control for, much less do a very good job of it. But um, back on, on point, you have to look at the methodology and look at the data and then determine from that whether or not their conclusions are supported by that. Because uh, there have been cases of studies where the researchers drew a conclusion that was almost completely the opposite of uh, what their data supported. And uh, I can't remember if Wilmore, there was a study that was done a long time ago on the effects of isonetic training at slow and, spa and fast speeds. And they reported that the fast speeds produced better improvements in strength at both slow and fast speeds and the opposite for the slow. But their data showed the opposite. Doing the exercise at the slow speed produced better improvements in strength at both slow and fast speed than doing it at the fast speed. So you can't you can't just look at abstracts, and you especially can't look at a magazine article and see scientific references and make assumptions about sport. I have gone through bodybuilding magazines before and followed references in the articles, and there have been lots of articles that cited studies that not only didn't support what they were saying, but they had nothing to do with what was being written. They just slapped on a bunch of references for the sake of making the article appear to be uh, more legitimate than it was. So, I mean, you've got to be really, really careful with it. And uh, just, uh, but just because a study is poorly done, doesn't mean that you can't learn something from it. If you are aware of the problems with the study design and how those affect the outcomes, you can still look at the outcome and keeping those problems in mind, you know, draw some valid conclusions from it. It's just that you have to be aware of what kind of problems there are. You have to read through the methodology so that you know you can recognize where, where they exist. And uh, yeah, I'd like to see more valid research done, but there are very, very few people out there that are doing 
research specifically on high intensity strength training that are doing it right, that are looking at these things and answering the questions that uh, need to be answered. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Um, talking about your, I'm really interested in um, you, you and your, your business as well. And I just, I'd just be interested to know what sort of projects are you focused on now? Is it, Right now, I'm just uh, working on writing. I'm, uh, I'm finishing editing on a book on advanced high-intensity training methods. Unfortunately, I had to go back and rewrite almost, almost the, the whole thing. Uh, uh, there was a section on pre-exhaust, and a study came out that showed if you pre-exhaust on an exercise versus performing you know, the compound exercises before the simple exercises, it made no difference at all to strength increases. And it also made no difference whether or not the simple exercise was performed immediately before the compound exercise or whether a minute uh, of rest was allowed in between. So I had to go back and I figured, you know what, if I'm going to rewrite this just to be on the safe side, I need to go and follow up on the research and all of these other you know, advanced training methods. And so I've been going through that, trying to get this book together. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, for all the time that I'm putting into it, it's going to have very, very really limited applicability because the majority of people, you know, probably aren't going to need to do a lot of advanced high intensity training. <laughs> it's going to be more for trainers than anybody else. I was going to ask. Um, I know. I noticed you obviously had a uh, some um, content in Tim Ferriss' Four Hour Body. Um, I'm a big, big Tim Ferriss fan. And I was wondering, do you use Tim Ferriss's um, techniques in your own business and managing your own time? Uh, there's oh, is that his time management stuff. No, I wish, uh, I wish yeah. four hours a week. It's, it's closer to 80. Um, <laughs> one time, I'm not talking with clients or over the phone or Skype, or if I'm not training clients here, I'm either reading or working on the website. Uh, probably at least about a quarter to a third of that time is just spent reading, trying to keep up with the research, which is that it's a it's a part time job in itself, just doing that. So I don't I don't have any big projects in the works right now. Just uh, kind of coming off doing a twenty one convention and uh, you know, working on the previous book, so kind of, kind of uh, taking it easy for uh, for the next. <laughs> Because you've, uh, I think you've got the number one spot for high intensity training on Google. So, do you find you have much competition for that, or have you niched yourself quite well? There, well, here's the thing. There's, there's a lot of people out there who are great, great information. Ryan Hall, great information. Doug McGuff, great information. Uh, Cyberpunk.com is actually where I started writing before I started Bay.com. Uh, there's some really good high intensity training sites out there, but. Uh, being good and being able to, to get a lot of incoming traffic, obviously, are two different things. I couldn't tell you how I got to that spot. I'm consistently in the top three results for high intensity training on Google. Uh, the only thing I can think of is that I've been consistent. I've been writing for that website specifically since about 1998. Uh, but interestingly, I, I actually have a Google alert for high intensity training training they send me a notification whenever new links are posted that they use that keyword and uh, it's a good thing that i'm towards the top because if people follow most of the other links that come up when you look up high intensity training they would find a lot of bullshit <laughs> yeah I, I agree definitely that's good it's good that you're you're up there um what are, I, I remember you you saying uh, you sent an email out as a while ago now to a lot of your users um, and it was quite a personal email, and you were talking about how you've kind of, you know, you got married and you let yourself go a little bit, and you thought that maybe you weren't practicing what you preached as much as what came across. Um, and it was really cool that you decided in that email that, you know, I'm going to turn things around. Uh, you look pretty good shape. Are you sticking that into that program? Um, I've, I've been consistent with it. I, uh, you know, when I was in college, I, I competed in bodybuilding, I was modeling for GNC. Oh, really? I, I stayed in, in excellent condition, and for most of the time after I got down here, after uh, I got married, I was a little bit less strict with it, and I've never gotten what I would consider fat, but after you've been in ripped condition, being having average body fat, you feel like you're, you're fat. Uh, so, you know, a lot of it's just uh, perception, 
but in some of it too is probably hormonal. Issue. I'm 41 now. I get tested. My testosterone was like in the, the basements, which isn't a good thing. Uh, but uh, just a combination of things. And I and I also mentioned in that email newsletter a while ago that uh, my wife and I are trying to have another baby, and uh, I was prescribed clomiphene citrate and an astrazole to, to help with fertility for that. And clomiphene stimulates an increase in luteinizing hormone, which and a follicle stimulating hormone in, increases uh, testosterone indirectly. So uh, that's uh, obviously played a role. And it's important that I bring that up because uh, if I were to tell my results over the past six months without mentioning that, it would be misleading. Uh, if I, I would have to go look at the numbers again, but the last time I measured, I think I was down about 17 pounds of fat and up about 14 pounds of muscle just in about the past half year, which for somebody in advanced uh, stage of training is, is considerable. But it was definitely not all from the training and diet. The, uh, the clomiphene and the nastrozole definitely had an effect. Okay, interesting. Um, okay, cool. So sort of shifting gears slightly, because I want to um, just touch on diet, actually. Um, what are your views on a vegan diet? If you wanted to wreck your health as quickly as possible, that would be the way to go. It's it's not the worst way to eat. Um, if you look at the way most people eat, at least, well, actually, I should clarify. It's possible to eat a vegan diet and have it be completely crap. Um, if you're you know if you're just eating things like you know Twinkies and uh, Skittles, technically it can be considered a vegan diet. Um, I'm assuming there's no real animal products in Twinkies, it's probably all hydrogenous <laughs> and all that. But, um, or a vegan diet could be mostly you know, fruits and nuts and vegetables. And there's obviously a big difference between the two. Uh, I uh, knew a girl who's a vegan whose favorite snack was uh, to eat uh, marshmallow cream out of a jar. Technically, it's, it's just sugar, it's vegan, but it's, it's crap. Uh, but, um, it's not the worst way to eat. It's, it's better than the way that a lot of people eat, stuffing themselves with the overly processed crap and way too much of it. But it's definitely not optimal. You know, uh, we are omnivores. We're not carnivores. We're not herbivores. We're omnivores. And while what is optimal for any individual varies considerably, we should be eating a more varied diet. Uh, most, I, I think the majority of what a person eats should be vegetables and fruits. I think uh, uh, a vegan diet is about uh, 75% of the way there. If you were to eat mostly vegetables and fruits, you would be doing much, much better than the majority of people. But I would also recommend adding to that healthy meat and fat. You know, beef, fish, yeah, chicken. Well, beef being the best of those. Uh, lots of eggs. But uh, in, in a nutshell... Beef, beef, or red meat, fish, eggs, lots of vegetables, moderate amount of fruits and nuts. And then anything else should be eaten sparingly. Cool. I've got a few more um, questions on that, actually. I'll ask you a, a bit later on. But um, just on fruit, um, I, I recently read uh, The One Diet, written by Simon Shawcross. Are you familiar with Simon? No. no. Okay. Oh, Simon Shawcross, yes. I, um, I, I'm not familiar with the book, but uh, I yeah, know Simon yeah, so um, we recently had a podcast as well, which was really good. And, you know, he talks about, and a lot of the um, kind of hunter-gatherer, paleo diet guys out there will say moderate fruit intake versus lots of fruit. Now, um, to be more specific about that, uh, I understand, obviously, you've got the fructose in fruit, which I understand is kind of um, released slowly into the, the blood because of the fiber content. But then you've got people saying, well, actually, fructose goes straight to the liver and then gets converted into triglyceride and i i'm my question to you is is it true that eating too much fruit will make you fat or not eating too much of anything if it results in an excessive calorie intake will make you fat but if you, you are eating a diet that is mostly fruit but you are not eating more calories than you're spending on a regular basis you're not going to be able to get fat it would not be optimally healthy because ideally a diet needs to provide adequate energy, but it also needs to provide adequate amounts and the right proportions of different micro and macronutrients that you need. And a diet that is consisting almost entirely of fruit is going to be deficient in some other things. Uh, 
protein and, and uh, healthy fats being, being the two biggest. But um, if you want to get fat, you have to eat too much. Now, how much carbohydrate is too much depends on the individual, too. You can have some people who can eat a relatively large amount of carbohydrate, and provided that they're not eating excessive calories, they'll put on little or no fat. You've got some other people who, yeah, if they're overeating carbohydrates, very, very quickly gain fat. But you've got to have a, a combination of two. There has to be excessive calories just in general, and you have to have the extra coming from carbohydrate if the person is going to gain fat from it. But just having a larger percentage of your diet from something like fruits or just something from like vegetables isn't going to make you fat if you're not eating too much altogether. Okay. There's a uh, just going back to the vegan diet quickly. Um, there's a, a famous free runner in the UK. Um, he's probably known globally now. Um, called Timothy Sheath. Um, he's he's an interesting bloke, a uh, good guy, and but he's very evangelical about veganism. Um, and he feels that you know he's an incredible athlete. And I think that like you were alluding to just now, it, a lot of it comes down to the individual's genetics, how they respond to food. Um, and he's going around telling everyone to eat vegan and saying that you can thrive on a vegan diet. But I feel like it's so he's such an anomaly. Would you, would you agree with that? The, the fact that a particular person has accomplished something by some method is not proof that the same or better results could not have been achieved some other way or that the way they did it or, or work equally well for other people. Um, a lot of times when people are trying to be successful at something, they try to model their approach after somebody else who has been successful. Almost always when people do that, they look at the approach, but they fail to consider unique traits and circumstances that allow or help that method to work. If you've got somebody who's got really good genetics, they can eat a lot of different ways, and they're going to be able to perform well. Now, he, he would perform better. I can say absolutely he would perform better on a sensible, omnivorous diet than he is performing on a vegan diet. The fact that he is able to perform well on a vegan diet doesn't mean that it's optimal for, for everybody else. Uh, whether it's training or whether it's nutrition, uh, you have to consider it in terms of general principles and then look at how those need to apply to the individual. And when you're looking at examples of somebody who has done something and been successful, it helps to, instead of looking at exactly what they did, trying to break it down into the general principles, and instead of trying to copy it exactly, try to do it in a way that applies best to the individual. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier a suntan analogy, and that uh, fits here too. It fits with a bunch of different things. Um, the same stress that causes a darker skinned person to get even darker is what causes a lighter skinned person to, to get darker. Exact same principles are involved. But if you took uh, uh, somebody from Norway and uh, had them try and copy the tanning schedule of somebody from the Mediterranean, you know, it might have worked well, perfectly for the person from the Mediterranean with darker skin, but it's going to result in a sunburn very quickly for, for the person from Norway. The principles are the same. You have to, you know, regularly apply that stress or expose your body to that stress, but then you have to allow it for time to recover and adapt in between. But how much of it they can tolerate and how much time they need in between will vary. Same kind of thing with, with nutrition. General principles apply equally to almost everybody, but you can't say that there's any one specific diet that works ideally across the board, one percentage of different macronutrients. It depends on individual response. It depends on how active the person is, what they're trying to accomplish, any health issues that they might have that might affect uh, what, how well they absorb and utilize what they eat. An important thing to also keep in mind is there's a big difference between food and nutrition. Food is what you're putting into your body. Nutrition is what you are getting out of that food, and that can be affected by a lot of different things. Um, anyways, I'm getting, I'm getting off topic here. The vegan diet is just a horrible way to go. The fact that somebody has done well on it doesn't mean that they wouldn't do even better on an omnivorous diet. And I've known people who have gone vegan, and invariably they, they switch after a couple months. You know, all except for a few hardcore ones that are 
doing it more for more misguided ideological reasons. Uh, they believe that uh, it is uh, less harmful to animals, which is the opposite. It couldn't be further from the truth. Um, raising beef, raising cattle, uh, chicken, pork, things like that, is much, much, much fewer animals suffer than farming grain and things like that. It's uh, really. They're, they're, they're completely delusional. They, they actually cause more animal suffering and death by being vegans, ironically. Uh, but an um, uh, example, when I was in college, and I, I'm not going to give too much information on it. No, that's all right. Cause please do. <laughs> I, I, know, I know somebody who was phenomenal condition, probably about 175, 180 pounds, just ripped. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, I ran into a mutual friend who told me that this person had started dating this woman, and she was a vegan, and he started following a vegan diet, and he had run into him a few months after this, uh, he had started dating her and become a vegan, and he thought that he was ill, that he was uh, had some sort of terminal disease because he had lost so much muscle mass, and he just looked sickly. Well, he ran into him again about a year later, and he looked like he did you know, before that. All the muscle was back, just as lean and everything. And he asked him what happened. Well, he broke up with this woman, went back to eating normally. In fact, to try and reverse the damage that he had done, he had gone to extremes with his fat intake because he hadn't been getting any, any healthy animal fats for a while. He actually ordered uh, large pails of lard that's meant for frying in restaurants, and then eating that with his meals. And he, he became a vegan, he got weak and sick and lost muscle mass. He switched back, and he gained that muscle mass back and his health. Um, I would not recommend veganism for anybody for any reason. I wouldn't recommend an all-meat diet either, but uh, I think people should eat a variety of foods. Again, lots of mostly vegetables and fruits, moderate amounts of meat, fish, eggs, uh, nuts, and then other things should be kept to uh, a minimum. You know, it's not going to kill you. For example, a lot of the paleo in the community are, are uh, big on you know, bashing grains, legumes, things like that. Now, there are nutritional problems with them, but they're not going to kill you. Yeah, if you're having small amounts occasionally, if you're eating, you know, bread and pasta and cereal, you know, but a bowl full or plate full every meal of the day, you're going to have some problems. But a slice of bread every once in a while or a little bit of rice or pasta isn't going to kill anybody, as long as the rest of the diet is well balanced. Yeah, cool. So uh, tell us about your diet at the moment. Right now? Lots of coffee. Give me a, give me a snapshot. <laughs> coffee, steak, and vegetables. I had to narrow it down. Usually, um, real, I keep it relatively simple. Because my wife does most of the cooking for dinner, I don't have a whole lot of control over that. So I have to do a little bit quicker <laughs> earlier in the day. She's, she's Filipino. So it's a lot of traditional Filipino dishes. Almost always chicken or pork or fish. Occasionally we have beef, but usually some sort of chicken, pork, or fish with some vegetables and rice. And sometimes I have a little bit of rice, sometimes I don't. But uh, dinner is whatever she makes. But earlier in the day, usually in the mornings, I'll just have coffee, eggs, sometimes some bacon with that, and a piece or two of fruit. In the afternoon, it's typically steak or chicken and a lot of vegetables, and then, you know, milk on and off throughout the day. I feel like drinking after I'm done with my coffee in the morning, the rest of the day it's always water and milk. Uh, but uh, that's it's pretty boring diet. Coffee, eggs, bacon, meat and vegetables, and then whatever my wife makes for, for dinner. That sounds pretty healthy, though. It's not too, not too exciting, but it, it's working. So. Cool. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about fat loss. Um, I've got some questions that have been on my mind for a while. What are your views about kettlebells? They are great doorstops. <laughs> um, the handle is in perfect position to be able to pick it up and set it down in front of the door to keep it open. Um, they are shit for exercise, though. Okay. The kettlebell differs from the, the dumbbell or the barbell 
in that the center of gravity is further from where the handle is. And they are designed to be used for swinging movements. But exercise should not involve swinging or heaving or yanking or jerking or throwing weights. Exercise movements should be performed in a slow and controlled manner. Uh, during exercise, slowing down the speed of movement, moving more slowly, lifting and lowering the weight, provides all the possible benefits of exercise without any risk. The faster you move, you don't increase the benefits, but you do increase the likelihood of injury due to a variety of causes. Now, one, that when you are accelerating a weight rapidly, the force required to do so increases considerably. Um, and especially as you're lowering the weight, if you're moving quickly and try to gradually slow it to a stop, you won't have much force. But if it's going fast and you have to stop it suddenly, the amount of force encountered can be considerable. Um, also, the faster you move, the poorer your control of body position and movement, the more likely you are to move into positions that are going to be irritating to the joints. And the faster you move, and especially with a lot of these movements where they advocate doing ridiculous numbers of repetitions, the more repetitive motion stress that you have. There is no reason to ever perform a swing during an exercise. Uh, there is no good reason to ever move fast during an exercise. There's a lot of reasons not to. There are no exercises that you that are worth doing that would be better done with a kettlebell than dumbbell or barbell or machine or even body weight. They are they're a fad. They're they're a fad that should have never been brought back. But and like I mentioned earlier, a lot of the reason for a lot of the bullshit in the fitness industry is commercial interests, trends. For people to be able to have something to sell, a lot of times, rather than try to provide you know, solid science-based information, they try to come up with something novel to differentiate themselves from what everybody else is doing, um, something entertaining. Uh, and then they attach some sort of uh, romantic connotations to it, like this is what the Russians were using or Bulgarians or whoever the, the popular badass group is at the moment. Uh, it's, it's, they're, they're just, it's, it's, there's no good way to put it, but kettlebell training is utterly fucking stupid. <laughs> well put. Um, is it more effective for fat loss to strength train multiple times a week? I think it might be, but you have to balance that against your ability to recover from an adapt exercise. Mm -hmm. Now, I mentioned earlier that exercise doesn't produce improvements stimulates improvements in the body, but there are some things that occur immediately after as a result of exercise for a limited time that are beneficial for fat loss. For a short period of time, and they actually have a study just recently showed that uh, high-intensity resistance training increased metabolism considerably over a period of something like 24, 48 hours after workout, more than the, more than the steady-state activity. But uh, when you strength train because of the demand on the muscles, because of the increased rate of protein turnover that follows that, you actually have a little bit higher metabolic rate for a short period of time after the workout. Uh, a lot of times you'll hear people uh, say if you gain a pound of muscle, you'll burn 50 extra calories a day or some, some is ridiculous. Now, a pound of muscle is going to burn about six or seven calories. But following strength training, every pound of muscle already on your body is going to be expending more calories because of the increase in the rate of protein turnover. So there's a beneficial effect in terms of metabolic rate. Also, when you perform intense strength training, you deplete muscle glycogen stores. With muscle glycogen stores depleted, incoming carbohydrate is preferentially stored as glycogen in the muscle. That of being converted to triglycerides stores fat. So there's that benefit. Uh, you, again, though, you have to balance it against the, the risk of overtraining because Beyond some point, increasing your frequency of training is going to start to interfere with your body's ability to recover from and produce the adaptation stimulated by it. And this, what that point is varies considerably between individuals. But when you pass that point, rather than continue to get stronger, you can actually start to cause a loss of strength and size, which is you don't want that while you're trying to lose fat. In fact, 
One of the biggest misconceptions about exercise and fat loss is that the role of exercise in a fat loss program is to burn more calories. Nothing you would do is going to burn enough calories to make it worth the amount of time it would take. Um, you, you see the advertisements claiming you burn 800, 1,000, whatever calories in an hour of certain activities. Nonsense. Um, unless you are working at, unless you are an elite athlete capable of working at an extremely high level of effort for that duration, you are not going to burn anywhere close to that many calories. Just no activity is worth doing for the sake of burning calories. The real role of exercise in a fat loss program is not to burn more calories, but to prevent the loss of lean body mass while fat is lost. And there's research, actually one of the most famous, it goes back to, I think, 1975. I want to say Goldberg or Goldspink. I can't remember the, the author's name. But the uh, mechanism of work-induced uh, skeletal hypertrophy or muscular hypertrophy, they found that rats that uh, had the gastrocnemius on one leg cut uh, so that the soleus would be overloaded when they were forced to run, had hypertrophy of the soleus even if they were even if they were deprived of insulin, testosterone, growth hormone, with all these different conditions, all of which were working against being able to gain muscle, they still improved. Now, on a strength training program, even yeah, ideally, if you want to build muscle mass, you're going to need to have a little bit more protein, a little bit more calories than what you require for maintenance. But it is possible for a person to, if they are strength training, to even build muscle while losing fat. It's difficult, uh, but you usually see it in people who are just starting out, people who are coming back to training after a long layoff, uh, or people who have been training incorrectly for years and finally figure out how to do it right. But um, if you're trying to lose fat, you want to make sure that what you are losing is fat and that you're not losing a combination of fat and muscle mass. Uh, otherwise, you just end up being a smaller uh, or a smaller fat person. Uh, the goal isn't necessarily just to reduce body fat, but to improve your ratio of lean body mass to fat tissue. If you are losing muscle in the process, is as long as you're losing more fat than muscle, it's an improvement. But it's going to be that much harder after you lean down to be able to keep it off, and you're going to look much much worse. If you were to take the average woman and uh, have her just lose you know, fat, it would not make nearly as much of a difference in her physique as if you had her lose fat and gain you know, at least a few pounds of muscle. In fact, it's one of the things that uh, I get to women who occasionally will bring up the whole fear of getting bulky thing. And a lot of the women that I train are a little bit older. And typically, a woman in her 40s or 50s will express uh, concern, oh, I don't want to become too bulky. And you ask them, well, when were you in the best shape of your life? Most of them will answer their teens or 20s. Well, the average person starts losing muscle gradually after the late 20s, about half a pound or so a year, if they're not doing any strength training to maintain it. So by the time these women are in their 40s or 50s, and they've got you know, 10, maybe 15 pounds less muscle than they did when they were in their teens and 20s. And I tell them, you pro I tell them this, I mean, you probably had this much more muscle then. And that was when you looked your best. And a big part of it is because of that. Muscle mass, although it doesn't burn a massive amount of calories, is metabolically active, active tissue. And the more of it you have, the more your body's burning. And although it's not going to burn a massive amount, if you've got you know, 10 more pounds of muscle, that's another 60 to 70 calories a day that you're burning. Not a whole lot over the course of a week, but over a long enough period of time, that makes a difference in your caloric expenditure and how much of what's going into your body ends up being stored as fat versus as energy. So uh, it's the most important thing that exercise can do for a person while they're trying to lose fat is not burn calories or any of this other stuff. It is to help them maintain their muscle mass while fat is being lost so that their body composition is improving as quickly as possible and they're not just becoming a smaller fat person. Mm -hmm. And if you, were, if you were to create the perfect fat loss blueprint based on what you just said, what would that look like? I'm sorry, say again? Oh, 
And we've got a strange squeaking. Oh, it stopped now. I don't know what that was. Um, <laughs> so if you were to create the... Can you hear me clearly now? Yeah. Yeah, okay. If you were to create the perfect fat loss blueprint, so exercise regime and diet. Now, I know this is quite difficult because it's quite prescriptive, but what are the broad strokes? And that, it's important that, that, that you mention that because anything that you do is going to have to be adjusted based on individual response. You can't give a single prescription that just works best for everybody. Um, you could aim for the middle and have something that works reasonably well for the majority of people, but it's not going to be perfect for everybody. Uh, so you can't say you need exactly this you know, at this time. You have to give general principles, and those principles have to be adjusted for the individual. Um, in a nutshell, the first and most important thing that you have to have if you don't lose body fat is a caloric deficit. If you don't have a caloric deficit, it doesn't matter what you're eating, you're not going to lose body fat. Because if there's no energy deficit, you're not giving your body any reason to take what's stored in fat cells. There has to be. Anybody who says that calories don't matter has their head up their ass. It, it absolutely matters. It, imagine two different groups. You got a group that's eating you know, too many calories and they have a shitty diet, and a group that's eating too many calories and they're getting you know, mostly relatively healthy food. You know, again, meat, fish, eggs, lots of vegetables, moderate amount of fruits and nuts. The group that's eating better is going to be healthier. They're probably going to perform better. They're going to be stronger. But, but and, and some of us will allow them to lose fat more efficiently when they cut calories. But if they're eating too much, they're still not going to lose any weight. Now, the other group that's eating like crap isn't going to lose weight either. But they're also going to be sick and weak and uh, generally perform like shit. Going the other way, if you do have a calorie deficit, it, may, it does make a difference from what you're eating. So it's not enough that you reduce the calories. You have to reduce the calories. That's the first and most important thing. But you have to make sure that when you do so, you're still getting as much nutrition as possible. Uh, you need a certain amount of protein. You need a certain amount of fat. Most people do well with at least a moderate amount of carbohydrate. And you need to make sure that these are all nutrient-dense sources so that when you're reducing calories, you're not reducing uh, other nutrients by too much. Because the better your diet, the better your body is going to function in every way, including metabolizing the fat stores for energy. If you, if you reduce calories, but you have a shit diet, you're not going to perform as well in your workouts, which is going to negatively affect that. Um, of course, you know, insulin is an issue with excessive carbohydrate and everything like that, although people forget insulin is also an anabolic hormone. You don't want to have low insulin. You just don't want to have it excessive. Uh, so calorie reduction is the first and most important thing. Second is that what you are eating is relatively well-balanced. And there is a lot of variety in what can be well-balanced for an individual, even at the carbohydrate intake. You get some people who swear you have to have you know, little carbohydrate intake. Some people say you can eat a lot of carbohydrates and have you know, low-fat intake. It depends on the person. Some people will do well with a little bit more carbohydrate. Some people have a more difficult time reducing body fat. They're still going to lose it. It doesn't matter what they're eating. If you reduce their calories enough, they're going to lose weight. But uh, you want to make sure, again, that it's coming mainly from, from fat, not other tissues. So you, you have to adjust this based on individual response. Uh, and then, of course, they should also be doing a strength training on a regular basis. But if I had to narrow it down to three things, Moderate calorie reduction, well balanced diet, and regular high intensity strength training. Now, there's a lot of other little things that you could do along with this that will improve results. Getting adequate sleep makes a huge difference. It has an effect on various hormones that can positively or negatively influence fat loss. Uh, getting, you know, drinking a lot of cold water and staying cool seems to make a, a considerable difference. Uh, your body expends a certain amount of calories every day just to maintain its core temperature. If you dress cooler, if you drink cold water, you are losing heat that your body has to replace by expending energy. So staying cold and cold water helps. Um, there's, there's, a, there's so many different little things that uh, have an effect on it, but the, the biggest really comes down to calorie reduction, 
eating a well-balanced diet. Yeah. Yeah. The easiest way is a well-balanced diet. Meat, fish, eggs, lots of vegetables, moderate amount of fruits and nuts, and regular high intensity strength training. Uh, do you advocate high fats? Um, depends on the individual. If, if a person doesn't need a lot of carbohydrate, they should get the calories that they're not taking in from carbohydrate from fat. It's not necessarily the best way to eat, but it's, if a person doesn't require that much carbohydrate, then there's no reason that they shouldn't get more of their calories from fat. In fact, it'd probably be better that they get more of the calories from fat rather than protein. Right, okay. Well, why'd you say that? Uh, well, well, then, well, then you can only take in so much protein before, instead of being used for, you know, tissue growth and repair, it just ends up being broken down into carbohydrate anyway. Mm -hmm. And the process involves an increase in cortisol, which you don't want if you're trying to stay lean. So, if a person, and, and protein requirements are something that, yeah, you don't need massive amounts of protein. Most people, if they're getting about three quarters to a gram of protein per pound of body mass, lean body mass per day, are getting plenty of protein. All this, all this claims you get to get two, three grams of protein, bullshit. You don't need massive amounts of protein. You may need slight, there's some research that suggests that muscle mass is maintained better with slightly higher protein intakes when you are restricting calories. But for somebody that's just trying to gain, you don't need a massive amount of protein. Uh, you're, you're and now meat, meat is about as nutritious a food as you can get, but there is a lot of nutritional benefit to eating lots of fruits, lots of vegetables. So in a, once a person has met their protein requirements, and if they're getting it from meat, eggs, and fish, they're getting, they're probably getting enough fat in the process. And they would probably get the most nutritional bang for their buck by filling up the rest of their calories with vegetables, fruits, and nuts. Right. Okay. Rather than yeah, you know, loading up. If they're getting enough fat already, loading up on more, yeah, you know, isn't going to help. If they need to reduce the carbohydrate, they got to make it up with something. Might as well make it up with fat. But it's not necessary to consume very, very high fat. Not necessary to consume very high carbohydrate either. What's necessary is that you adjust the intake of both based on how somebody's responding. To it. Okay, that's, that's that's interesting. That brings me to my next question. Um, you mentioned there just just now that you don't need to eat a lot of protein to gain lean muscle um, necessarily. Um, I get confused with this because you know uh, I think in Four Hour Body Tim Ferriss talks. About, I mean I know like you said you, you don't necessarily agree with um, you know a gram or one point five grams of protein per pound of lean body weight in order to get gains. Um, when you're reducing, when you're on a calorie restricted diet, getting closer to about 1.4, 1.5 grams per pound of lean body mass may help maintain lean body mass better, but it's not necessary most of the time. Okay. You get adequate calories. That is something to think about. Now, when you strength train, you're going to have an increase in protein turnover throughout the whole body. So there's more of a demand for protein. Somebody who's working out regularly needs more protein than somebody who doesn't. But that amount is not massive. And if you think about the amount of protein required to build muscle mass at an impressive rate, it's not that much either. Now, first off, most people are not, after the first couple of months of training, most people aren't going to be building 5, 10 pounds of muscle a month. In fact, most people that are more advanced trainees would be doing pretty good to gain you know, half a pound to a pound of muscle a week. Well, most of that muscle is going to be water and muscle glycogen. Like 20 something percent of the remaining is fats and proteins. It's, so even at, even at a relatively good rate of muscle gain, you know, the actual protein content of the muscle that's being gained is a few ounces a week. You don't need to consume a massive amount of protein for your body to be able to synthesize that. You need a little more protein, you need a little bit more calories, but it doesn't have to be a huge amount. The reason that so much protein intake is recommended is because it sells protein powders. Now, protein powders are great if you're pressed for time, uh, but they're not necessary. Most people, if they're careful about how they plan their diet, can get all the protein that they need from meat, fish, and eggs. Yeah. So it's, uh, but 
Hang on with, with the body, it comes back to all, the bodybuilding magazines, fitness industry. A lot of what people are told is based on what is going to be profitable for them. Now, if you tell people, you don't need to buy this supplement and that. And not, and not, I'm not bashing supplements in general. There are a couple supplements that are worthwhile that will provide some benefit. But uh, most of them provide no advantage over just eating a well-balanced diet. I mean, yeah, meat, fish, eggs, lots of vegetables, moderate fruits and nuts. You follow that, and then little bits of everything else occasionally, you'd be doing pretty well. That, that gets you 99% of the way there. Now, if a muscle magazine is telling people that, they're going to piss off the people who are advertising protein powders in there who want people to think that they need to take more of that. So a lot of the stuff, if you you have to think of the muscle magazines, all the bodybuilding magazines, and even things like men's fitness as just big catalogs for supplements and equipment. And everything that they print in these things is geared towards creating the belief that people need all this, this garbage. They, 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 yeah, there's a few supplements that are beneficial. Now, creatine, um, DHEA, yeah, um, fish oil, vitamin D. There's certain things that people would benefit from, especially if you're indoors most of the time. If you're in a colder climate, vitamin D helps. But a lot in the UK. <laughs> one of the, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. One of the, one of the things, one of the biggest jokes over the past couple of years is that it's nitrous oxide yeah, uh, supplement. It's nonsense. It's a scam. You don't get yeah. anything from that. And the same with a lot of the so called testosterone boosters. Now, there are some things that will have a favorable effect, but not like what is claimed in the bodybuilding magazine. The only effective, really, really effective testosterone boosters are the ones that you have to get through the pharmacy. You're not, you're not going to get anything at GMC or Whole Foods or any of these places that's going to have a significant effect on testosterone. In fact, changing your diet so you're getting more meat and more healthy fats would probably have, a, if you're not already doing so, would probably have a bigger effect on your testosterone than anything that you could get at GMC. If you're already eating that, eating more isn't going to make that much of a difference. But if you're a vegan, you want to increase your testosterone, the best thing you can do is stop being a vegan. <laughs> okay. Um, just So just to clarify what you said there, you said um, when it comes to gaining lean muscle, that actually you're better off focusing on calorie intake, but that is predicated on a well-balanced diet Yes. versus <laughs> focusing on just protein consumption. No, not just protein. You have to have, you need adequate protein. If you're if you have enough calorie, you need two things. You need to have the energy and you need to have the materials for your body to be able to produce the exist muscle mass. If you have adequate calories but you don't have enough protein, you'll build muscle if you don't have what muscle is made of. But once you have enough protein, getting more doesn't help. It doesn't make any, any difference. Mike Mentor used to compare it uh, he, he, like to trying to push with a rope. Now, after you've gotten more, enough protein, any more isn't going to make any difference. You can't force muscle gain by eating more protein. You stimulate your body to produce the increase in muscle, and then you provide it with what it needs to do that. But you can't just put protein in and, and expect your body to say, well, we've got extra protein. Let's make muscle up. No, the stimulus is, is what determines that, and you're only going to synthesize so much based on uh, genetic factors. Now, here's a, and I mentioned this earlier, is, is you know, how much you're getting in terms of energy and in terms of protein is an uh, important part of it, but the quality of the overall diet is going to affect health and bodily function in general. The healthier you are, the better your body will be capable of performing all these different processes. If, uh, if for example, you had a diet that provided adequate calories and adequate protein, but the entire rest of it came from pizza and Twinkies and uh, candy bars, you're not going to be able to perform very well in your workouts. You're not going to function very well. Your body is not going to be able to produce, to recover from and produce the adaptations to exercise as efficiently or as well as if you were fueling it properly. So it's, it's a lot of things. You can't take 
fitness and break it down and say just one thing, just getting enough calories, just getting enough protein. It is a combination of a lot of things. You have to have those, but you also have to have everything else relatively well balanced. You have to. In fact, if I if I had to summarize it, rather than think of muscle gain or fat loss or any specific goal with diet. If you focus on eating in a way that makes you as healthy as possible, that will that that is the first and most important step towards optimizing performance and body composition. If you eat for health, those other things are going to follow. Now, and the same thing could be said with uh, strength training and general fitness. If you train to become stronger, everything else is going to improve along with that. Eat for health, train for strength, and that is going to get you about as, as far as you can possibly get in whatever direction that you're trying to go. So it sounds really straightforward, but it's fascinating because it's, it's just it really. <laughs> yeah. Um, a, lot, a lot of little, little uh, it depends, and uh, under these circumstances, it's, it's all sorts of exceptions. I understand the caveat. Details. Detail. Yeah, it, uh, it's it's not. But 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 to simplify it, though, that's really it. If you if you want to if you want to look better, if you want to perform better, if you want to feel better, you want to eat in a way that makes you as healthy as possible. If you want to again look and feel and perform better, if you focus on building strength, you're going to improve everything else in the process. Um, cardiovascular and metabolic conditioning can be improved to greater degree with strength training in a shorter time and with less risk of injury than doing any kind of steady state activity, running, cycling, swimming, any of that crap. Now, if somebody likes doing that for fun, great, they should do it for fun. But if they just want the exercise benefits, strength training is going to give them that faster, with less time invested, and with, with most importantly, less risk of injury in the long run. Um, same thing with bone and connective tissue strength. When you're performing an exercise, your muscles are producing movement, but they're doing it by pulling on your tendons and pulling on your bones. You're going to have forces transmitted through your connective tissue and skeletal system that also stimulate adaptations in those tissues. As you strength train, your muscles don't just get stronger. Your connective tissue and your bones get stronger. In fact, uh, archaeologists cannot tell by bones that they've dug up what type of person you know, that they, they found if it was a laborer or somebody who didn't by the bones. Somebody who did a lot of heavy manual labor is going to have thicker attachment points and higher density uh, around areas, for example, where the, the biceps inserts onto the radius. If you have somebody who's doing a lot of heavy carrying over time, that's going to adapt, not just the muscles, of course, aren't there anymore. If, uh, you know, decayed away long before they get dug up. But you can still look at the bone and have a, an idea of what kind of things those people did during life. I'm getting off topic here, but uh, for bone, bone and connective tissue strength, flexibility. Flexibility is uh, largely strength. Being able to move through a full range of motion requires the muscles that are producing the movement to have the strength to do so. The other part of it, people think about muscles being tight, but it's not so much because of the length of the muscle, but rather a nervous system trying to prevent you from extending to the point where you're at risk for an injury. Anyway, so if you strength train and if you perform exercises that involve joint movement through a relatively full range of motion, you are going to achieve, or if you've already got it, maintain a level of flexibility that is adequate for much anything that you would need to do. The only time that people would need supplemental stretching would be if they're involved in any kind of an activity, uh, dance, some forms of martial arts, uh, or if they're uh, recovering from an injury where they have to be immobilized for a period of time and they need more flexibility for that. But most people would get everything that they need out of a strength training program involving a full range of motion around all the major joints. Uh, body composition. You know, I mentioned earlier strength training, the effect on metabolic rate, the effect on you know, glycogen muscles, and just having more muscle. If you were to keep the same amount of fat but gain muscle, your body composition would improve. So gaining muscle mass, getting stronger, improves the body composition, makes it easier for you to lose fat, improving the body composition. Now, pretty much everything that you could improve through exercise 
you can improve most effectively, most efficiently, and most safely through proper spring strength. Mm -hmm. what, what's your view on fasting? Of what? Fasting. What do you think about fasting? Fasting? Uh, I don't think it's necessary. I think there may be some benefits to it, but it's the research is all over the place. And you have to kind of look, like L. Darden likes to say, when you're looking at the research, whoever puts the uh, money in the jukebox gets to choose the song that's played. <laughs> you got to kind of take the, the results, and especially when you're reading other people's interpretations of the research. You've got to take some of the grand salt. But uh, there have been studies comparing different meal frequencies, one meal a day versus three meals a day, same amount of calories total, it should no difference. No difference. Really? So if there was a huge advantage in fasting, then you would have seen something in some of these. But I think the benefit of it has nothing to do with the difference in how the body is utilizing the calories or utilizing what's being put into it. But rather that people who have a difficult time controlling their food intake may have an easier time doing that if they just don't eat at all for a certain period of time. That takes the choice out of the matter entirely. Instead of having to worry about making a good versus a bad choice at a couple meals a day, you only have that one meal a day. And uh, as, But here's the thing. Even if a person's fasting for most of the day, if they overeat during the brief window of time that they're eating, they're still not going to lose fat. It doesn't matter how long they're, they're not eating. They can't do that and still lose fat unless there's a calorie deficit. Regardless of your you're eating one meal a day or you're eating seven or eight, mm. you're not going to lose fat unless you have a calorie deficit. And uh, yeah, it's, it's more of a psychological thing, I think, than anything else. And, and for people, uh, again, who uh, have difficulty making good decisions at certain times, I know some people like to snack. Yeah, they're sitting in front of the computer or the TV at night, yeah, and they... They're putting chips or whatever in their mouth. If they limit the hours that they eat and they can't eat after a certain time, yeah, it has nothing to do with the fasting period versus the eating period. It has to do with the fact that it's reducing the total calories that are going into their body. Um, just uh, just going back into talking about um, the optimal conditions to gain lean muscle. Um, let's say because I, I I read your article the other day about you know the steps to kind of gaining. Um, producing best results in terms of strength and muscular size. Um, and you mentioned in there about, you know, you really, you do have to have kind of a minimum number of calories. Uh, I mean, if I'm wrong, as well as all those other uh, variables. Now, if you have insufficient calories, your body might be able to produce some muscular increase at first at the expense of your fat. But you, again, this is usually only the case in people who have a lot of fat for people who are just starting training or resuming after a long layoff. In most cases, if people want to gain muscle mass, they need a calorie surplus. What I don't recommend is just going on a bulking diet and just eating a massive amount of calories. This will cause this will help with muscle gain, but also cause you to lose a whole lot of, or gain a whole lot of fat in the process. And then after you've got a certain amount of muscle, you have to spend another you know couple of months dieting to get back down to a decent body composition. Yeah. What I would recommend instead is starting with your estimated maintenance calories and keeping track of three things, your workout performance, your uh, weight, and your body composition, and gradually increasing your calories over a period of months. When you get to a point where you are steadily gaining weight, but your body fat percentage is not increasing very quickly, you know that you found the right amount of, of calories to take. Now, as you get bigger and stronger, this is going to have to gradually increase a little bit further. So if it starts to slow down, you can gradually increase that. It's more muscle mass, higher metabolic rate. But it's better to gradually increase the calories and try to put on as little fat as possible while gaining muscle, then getting a bunch of fat along with it, and then spending a bunch of time on a calorie deficit. Because the longer, the more fat you gain, the longer you have to diet afterwards to get it off, and the longer you're at a calorie deficit, the harder it's going to be for you to maintain the muscle you gain. You're better off gaining more slowly, but minimizing the fat gain so that, you know, let's say you set a limit, and you say, 
Say you're 11, 12 percent body fat. You don't want to let yourself get, say, 14 is your limit. When you get to a point where you're up to 14, you diet back down. It's only going to take you a few weeks, not a long enough time that you're going to lose appreciable amount of muscle mass. So that, and here's the other thing: most people who do this are doing this because they want to look better. Most people are going to, most people are going to have a better improvement in their physique and appearance from losing some fat than they are from building some muscle. If you build, you know, 10 pounds of muscle, but you put 20 pounds of fat on in the process, you're not going to look better. If you were to lose, you know, most people lose 20, 30 pounds of fat without gaining an ounce of muscle, they look much better. Ideally, you want both, but uh, you don't want to put on a lot of fat along with muscle. Uh, not if your goal is to improve your physical appearance anyways. And the same for fat loss. You're better off trying to lose slowly than trying to lose rapidly because the faster you try to lose fat, the greater the calorie deficit, the harder it is to maintain lean body mass. You want to put on muscle slow to minimize fat gain, and you want to lose fat slow to minimize muscle loss. It doesn't come on overnight. You're not going to lose it overnight. And muscle mass doesn't grow. It doesn't appear that quickly either. So, you know, you can't, you can't rush it by overeating. Yeah. You have to stimulate the body to produce the increases. Give, it, give your body what it needs to do that. You know, again, adjusting over time based on the response. And ultimately, how quickly the muscle comes on has to do more with your genetics and how hard you train than uh, whether or not you're, you know, eating uh, some particular amount of calories. Let's say you've reached your goal in terms of body fat percentage and um, lean muscle size. Do you then, do you, I suppose, I guess, I guess at that point you just maintain the diet you're eating as long as those variables are staying the same? Yeah. I think, I think I, I've kind of answered my own question in my head, but I think because I always thought that it took a certain, you know, a, a excess of calories in order to put on, or, or an excess of protein, which you debunked, um, in order to put on lean mass. It takes, it's, more protein, sorry. it takes more protein for a person to build muscle than what the average person requires just to maintain body mass who doesn't do any strength training. With strength training comes an increase in the demand of protein requirements. So you don't have to eat more. You just don't have to eat massive quantities. You don't have to take in the two to three grams per pound of body weight per day that uh, some people recommend. Yeah. If, you're, if you're getting, again, about three quarters to a gram per pound of lean body mass, you're fine. If you want to keep it simple, a, a gram per pound of body weight is easy for most people to do. If they're eating, if you're eating adequate calories, it's not that hard to get that much protein. If you plan around the protein, if you know that you've got to get, say, just to make the math easy, you got to get 150 something in that grams of protein, then you want to try to average 50 grams or so per meal. Or if you're having a you know, couple uh, meals during the day maybe and snacks, maybe uh, 35, 40 grams per, per meal, another 20, 25 or so on two different snacks. After you know what you're getting for protein, you can calculate what you need for the rest of your calories. Any, almost any you know, protein source is going to come with a little fat, so it's going to have a little bit more calories than just the protein. So you look at, okay, I've got my protein planned out. Now what do I need for the remainder? How many more calories do I need? And then you can add to, to make up the difference. But planning it around the protein makes it easy for most people to get the adequate protein. Again, you don't, you need more if you're strength training than if you're not, but you don't need massive quantities of it. Mm. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I think um, I think you basically answered my question, which is that if you are once you reach um, the the goal in terms of lean mass and, and and percentage of body fat, it's just about kind of maintaining the the caloric and nutrient the sort of macronutrient intake. It's not, a, yeah. You won't be, you won't be dropping it because you won't have an excess in the first place. Yeah. yeah. Mm. You don't, cool. you don't, you, it's. I mean, what that actually ends up being is going to vary between individuals. So you don't want to, you don't want to just follow a plan that somebody else did. Uh, whatever you end up doing, and, and if, if your listeners uh, take anything away from this, it should be that every single thing that they do. They shouldn't, they shouldn't just, just do blind line. They should be keeping track of what they are trying to accomplish. If they're moving towards it, 
then they know that they're doing things right. If they're not, then they need to make changes until they are. But they shouldn't just follow any program as is. Now, there are some good programs, good diets that if you follow as is, will produce good results for most people. But if you want the best possible results, you have to tweak things based on your response time. To be able to do this objectively it requires that you keep track of all these things. You keep tra- if, you don't, if you're not keeping track of what you're doing in your workouts and what you're doing with your diet, if you're not keeping track of goal-specific measurements, if you want to lose fat, you got to track your, your, your weight and your body fat. Um, if you're trying to build muscle mass, you need to also track you know, body composition and weight, but also circumference measurements. You need to keep track of all of these things so that you can compare them over time and so that when you do make changes, you can determine what effect the change had, if any, and whether it's getting you closer to where you want to be or further from it, so you know how to adjust. But any program, any diet that's decent should be viewed as a starting point from which to make adjustments based on how the individual responds and what their requirements are. Okay. What are your views on prolonged sitting? It is not good, and uh, I, I I can't stand. I, I mentioned earlier spending most of my time writing and and doing a lot of reading. One of the things that I, I ought to do is start uh, walk. I walk when I am doing book reading, but with studies, unfortunately, most of the studies I read online, it's it is not good for people to spend most of the day seated. And the reason for this is again, your body adapts to how it's how. And you have a couple problems with being seated for a long period of time. Most, mostly, it's just your hip flexors becoming tired because you're in a shortened position for most of the day. So, if a person has a job where they have to spend a lot of time sitting, I would recommend getting up for a couple minutes, you know, at least, at least once or twice an hour, and moving around. And even better, getting a stand-up desk, which uh, yeah, I, I ought to do. One of I have one. I have one right now. I'm actually standing at mine. But yeah, and you can't you can't be seated for a long period of time. It's not good for you. You have to get up and, and move around on a regular basis, or you're going to have problems with your hip flexors. You're going to lead to back problems, which are going to lead to all sorts of other problems. Um, what uh, you can do, in fact, instead of just getting up and moving around. Is perform a uh, stretch. I can't remember what the name of it is, but the, uh, when you're laying prone and you extend your back, pushing up on your arms, I've seen it in yoga. I can't remember what the hell the name of it is, but stretching out the hip flexors. And another thing that a person can do is what's called a Samson stretch, which is uh, kind of like a lunge. Uh, there's, you know, there's a couple things you can do to stretch the hip flexors, but you ought to do something for that at least a couple times a day if you're spending a lot of time seated. Mm. Okay. Cool. Are you still, I remember in previous interviews you've, you've said that yoga and Pilates is is uh, nonsense. Do you still believe that? Well, Pilates, Pilates is nonsense. Pilates oh, I see. Joseph Pilates was the Tony Little of his day. Yeah, he yeah, came he up with that because he was in a building full of dancers. He had to have something to try and sell. Um, yeah. Pilates is a joke, and it's an even bigger joke that they brought it back and people are buying into that crap. Uh, you can't lengthen muscles. You can't change the uh, proportions of somebody's body to make them look more like a dancer by doing Pilates. Uh, a lot of the claims that they make are just ridiculous. Now, yoga... It, it depends on what you're doing. Now, calisthenics, doing body weight exercise, whether it's dynamic or whether you're performing a static hold, is effective. Thing is, most of the positions in yoga, while they might be challenging, are not the most efficient way to target the different muscle groups in the body. Um, it's not a horrible thing to do, as long as you're avoiding the crazy uh, hot yoga stuff. I think the big thing. Yeah. Uh, I know uh, Ashtanga is uh, one of the harder forms, which is about the closest to being actual exercise. But if a person wanted to do some kind of a body weight activity like that, they would be better off with regular calisthenic exercises. Body weight squats, chin-ups, 
uh, push-ups, uh, push dips, dips, inverted rows, uh, hip extensions on the floor. There's so many things that a person could do with their body weight. That would be so much more effective for improving muscular strength and even flexibility than, than yoga. Mm -hmm. I mean, yoga's not, I would, if I had to choose between yoga and Pilates, I'd take yoga over Pilates. But if you have to choose between any form of, of uh, and I, I actually, I wouldn't even count, call Pilates an exercise. Pilates is a scam. Um, if you had to choose just one thing, that would be high intensity resistance training done you know, in a slow and controlled manner. Now, moving slowly during exercises but moving quickly between exercises so that you have a little, very little rest in between. If you do that, you're going to get all the potential benefits of exercise more quickly and more safely than doing any other activities. I'm acutely aware that you have 10 minutes left. Is that right? Uh, yeah. yeah I gotta get okay. okay, great. Um, it's just a couple things. Just one last main question I wanted to ask you, which really like to get your response on this is, um, and when it comes to sports-specific fitness, now I'm familiar with Doug's uh, is 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 better body by science on this. How much can you improve sports-specific fitness, and how quickly to a decent level of fitness does it take to acquire? There's no such thing as sports-specific fitness. Okay. <laughs> fitness can be broken down into a couple different categories. You have muscular strength, mm -hmm. um, and local muscular endurance is related to that. You have cardiovascular and metabolic conditioning. You have flexibility. You have joint and connective tissue strength. You have body composition. These are general factors of functional ability or, or fitness. And if you improve those, it's going to improve your ability to perform any sport. What is specific to the sport is the skills of the sport and the pacing and endurance sports. The best possible combination of, of strength and conditioning and practice for an athlete would be to do high-intensity training program and then focus on the specific skills of their sport. Um, a lot of things that athletes do in practice are ridiculous wastes of time. Uh, a lot of drills that uh, are meant to improve agility that are better, you know, have, don't even closely resemble how they actually move on the field. Uh, the best thing that you can do is take the sport, break it down into the fundamental skills, and focus on training those specific skills in combination with practice and classroom time, a big part. And I don't know how, you know, if most people have an athletic background who appreciate this a little bit more, but I don't think a lot of people are aware of how much study and learning goes into being a good athlete in terms of understanding the strategies of the sport, in terms of understanding the different plays. Uh, so I'm getting off topic here, but there's no such thing as sport-specific strength training you, or sport-specific exercise. Exercise improves things that will apply regardless of what you do. The only thing that's specific to any particular sport is practicing the sport itself. And that's more a matter of skill than anything else. Okay, so I just I just need to clarify something here then. So I understand what you're saying. So high intensity strength training for physical conditioning, and um, and then to breaking the sport down into its drills that would be done in a competitive environment as they would be done on on the, let's take on a basketball player, right? So let's take basketball player. You do layups and jump shots as they would be done in game intensity. However, when you play basketball for the first time, having not played for a long time. And you haven't been playing, but I've been doing high intensity strength training. I do not have a high level of court fitness. You know, I can't get up and down the floor as well. Now, how do you explain that? The same thing happens in colder climates to joggers. People who run during the summer and then they stop when it gets cold uh, later in the fall. They start up again in the spring. And even if they've been working out that time, they're going to have a harder time getting up and doing the same miles that they did not because they have become less strong or less conditioned if they've been doing some sort of strength training in between, but because some of the skill of the movement is lost. When you become skilled at an activity, it becomes easier for you to do for a longer period of time, not so much because of the conditioning effect of the activity, but because 
Skill is an improvement in your ability to effectively accomplish a task without wasting movement. You become more efficient at performing the movement. You waste less energy doing it. After a few weeks, you will have regained that skill to a point where it becomes easier, not because your conditioning has gotten better, specifically because of the running around, but rather that you are moving more efficiently, wasting less energy, so you don't fatigue as rapidly. Uh, a big part of endurance performance is proper mechanics so that you maximize the efficiency of movement and practicing those so that you improve that further. The more efficient your movement, the less energy you waste, the longer you can do it without fatigue, and that efficiency just comes down to practice. If you haven't done something for a while and you start doing it again, you're going to fatigue more quickly at first. But after doing it for a short period of time, you know, regaining those skills, you should very quickly get back to a point where it's it's not as fatigue. But it's not because of any specific condition. Any any type of metabolic improvement that could be obtained from that activity is going to also be obtained from strength training. So if you're already doing that, that's already there. You've got that. What you don't have is the efficiency of movement that comes with practice. Now, one of the best examples of this is uh, Nautilus uh, did the research at West Point Military Academy in the 1970s. The project total condition. They had athletes that were just doing Nautilus workouts, high-intensity strength training, you know, controlled speed of movement, rushing between exercises. And they compared that over a period of six weeks to the football team who was doing you know, their own strength and conditioning, more conventional weight training, in addition to regular running and football practice. Well, the group that was doing the uh, Nautilus training was doing no running, but they had better improvements in running than the group that was practicing it because the Nautilus training was so much more effective at improving the general factors of fitness, specific to the running, strength and the uh, you know, cardiovascular metabolic conditioning, that it made up for the lack of practice. Uh, not that that's the best approach. If you want to become a better runner, you should strength train, but then also you know, learn mechanics and practice the running. But you can get a significant improvement from strength training alone. The reason I bring this up is if you've been strength training all along, it's not your conditioning that's holding you back when you start a new activity or start up an activity again, but rather you're just not performing the movements as efficiently, so you're wasting more energy, so you're going to fatigue more quickly. Okay, got you. How, um, so so that, that's really fascinating that you can... Um, you know that you basically improve your um, you, you spend less energy uh, as you get better at the skill now how quickly can you improve that economy and when does that when is there diminishing returns depends on, on the person and depends okay. on how quick how frequently they're practicing and the quality of the practice uh, you have to well, first off you need to know that you're performing the movements correctly some of the things are odd you know, like running you know, there's more to running than putting one foot in front of the other. And a good coach can teach somebody better mechanics to run more efficiently. Obviously, you know, shooting a free throw in basketball, you know, uh, throwing a jab, hook, cross, anything like that in, in boxing, all those things are specific skills that you have to have mechanics down to do well. But if you've got good coaching and you know what the mechanics are, practicing those is going to improve it. How much depends on how far you are from how from a high level of skill. It depends on whether you've done it before. If you are relearning a skill that you previously learned, it's going to go a lot faster than if you're learning to do something for the first time. Uh, yeah. it, it's going to vary a lot between individuals. But uh, another example of this is uh, another hit trainer in uh, Australia that uh, I, I communicate with who also boxes. I uh, posted something on uh, web, my website recently. He hadn't been boxing for months, hadn't been you know, doing any sparring or anything like that, just doing high-intensity strength training. And when he went back to boxing, he actually felt even like he's in even better condition, despite not having done that for all that time, because just doing the high-intensity strength training helped maintain, actually improve his uh, overall uh, cardiovascular and metabolic condition. That's fascinating. You know, it, he's obviously going to perform better after being back in boxing for a few weeks because of the practice. But the, the, there is functional ability 
for most people, most people call that functional ability, your ability to function physically, um, is made up of general and specific components. The general components apply to everything you do. If you get stronger, you can use that strength in any physical activity. Strength is general. Uh, if you strengthen your biceps to forming curls, then you know, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be able to use that strength picking up something heavy off the ground. If you strengthen your glutes and hamstrings doing deadlifts, it doesn't mean that that strength can't be applied during running or jumping. If you make a muscle stronger, it is going to be able to improve your ability to perform any other activity involving that muscle. Strength is general. The same with cardiovascular and metabolic conditioning. If you improve these, it will improve your ability to perform any activity which is demanding on those systems. Uh, the stronger your bones, bones, and connective tissue, the more resistance you're going to be to injury. Uh, flexibility you know, really depends on the activity and how much movement is required. But for most activities, if you have a now, if you have enough flexibility to be able to perform most basic barbell or machine movements over four inch motion, you've got to add extra the flexibility for that. And if you improve flexibility in general, it's going to allow you to perform you know, movement over greater range of motion on anything. These are all, all general. If you improve them, they contribute to everything that you do physically. Where it gets tricky is with the skills, because the skills are specific. If you if practice a barbell exercise, you're going to get stronger doing it, but you're also going to become more skilled at that barbell exercise. So you may not see as much of an improvement in performance on another bicep exercise that you don't practice because exercise performance is affected by both strength and your skill in performing the exercise. If you're going to learn, if you're going to practice a sport, you know, the strength training alone will make you a better athlete, but not as good as you can be because it's not enough to be in good condition. It's not enough to be strong. You have to be able to effectively, efficiently apply that strength and conditioning, and that requires skill practice. In fact, uh, during the, the preseason and during the season, the practice is far more important than the resistance training. The, the focus on getting stronger and better conditions should be in the off season. And then during the season, most of the emphasis should be on just maintaining strength and trying to minimize the injuries on the field or on the court. Uh, and oh boy, I've got a couple clients who are athletes and coaches. And one of the hardest things getting most of them to do is to cut back the amount of strength training that they're doing in season. If people want to want to be in the gym, they think if they're not on the field or on the court, they need to be in the gym working out. Psychological, yeah. It can actually work against them. In fact, uh, during you know, preseason and, and in season for a lot of sports, when you're practicing more frequently, you have to cut the resistance training back. Uh, once, and again, because you have to balance these activities against each other, if you're already doing you know, several practices a week, adding you know, strength training on top of that, it's an, in, it's an additional demand that your body has to be able to recover from to be able to produce adaptations. And anybody can only handle so much activity within some time frame before they start to, to be overtrained. And overtraining is one of the worst things that you can do as an athlete. Uh, it will kill your performance. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, that's an awesome point. I, I, I run, the alarm was to, to pick my son up from school. Um, if, if you want, uh, we can schedule for a follow-up to, to if you have any additional questions yeah. later during the week. Yeah, that will. Um, I probably wouldn't be able to do this week, but I certainly um, would like to do a part two. That would be great. So I'll come back to you with some dates. Well, yeah, yeah. Shoot me an email, and then uh, we'll set something up. Yeah. Lastly, and um, just for the viewers and for you, um, what's the best way for people to contact you and find out about your services? The the best way for people to contact me is through bay dot com. It's b a y e dot com. Uh, there are comments enabled on all the articles, so if they have questions about anything that they read on there, you know, feel free to post them in the comments, and I you know, try to answer questions on the web uh, every day as I've got time. All that information Great. I'll put that all in the show notes. There was a little bit of inter interference there, but it'll be in the show notes, so don't worry. <laughs> Look, Drew, um, thank you so much. Oh, no problem. i got to run. Take it easy, Lawrence. See you soon. Cheers.